Uh, we have uh, today a guest, um, and he, he's a friend of mine, a colleague who has worked here. Uh, I've, I've worked with him for the last six years. He's the one that taught me about student affairs. As I came in, you know, I'm an academic faculty member, and he, he gave me my, my uh, street cred on the student affairs side, taught me how to manage in that world. And, any mistakes I've made of mine or any successes I have, I have to give him the nod. Could we? Is this his take? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was telling David about this uh, course, and he told me, he said, well, you know, Charles, I was a student here around the time that you're discussing with Black Americans for Democracy. So I thought it would be good for you to hear from a student who was a part of the majority because you know so often how we engage a place affects what we remember and what we how we feel and so i thought it would be refreshing and enlightening to hear david's story about his time here and to get some sense on how he felt as a student and how others like him engaged the black power movement because that's what they were engaging here on this campus as it played out so david he's a good storyteller he told me many stories <laughs> and i'm sure i've got more to, to learn so okay okay um they sent me a group of questions yeah that i'll never get to <laughs> but i tried to, to sort them out into some areas and some of it was about um my time at the university as a student. Some of it was about uh, racial issues that we dealt with as a student. Some of it was about my career path, how I get here. Um, and then I'm gonna throw in some heritage stuff um, if I have time at the end. So 1965, what's that, 55 years ago? Uh, I was a freshman. Uh, I graduated from high school in um, Little Rock, Paul High. Um, in those years, every uh, male freshman and sophomore student was in either Army ROTC or um, Air Force ROTC, but you had to have perfect eyesight for Air Force ROTC. So I ended up in Army ROTC. And the military was um, was just the presence. You were going in. And what color uniform are you going in? Or you could go to Canada. You know, you didn't have to go. But there was no voluntary, no volunteer army of professionals like there is now. There was no lottery which came a little bit uh, later on the draft uh so that was that was the overwhelming feel of the campus at that very first time um i'm going to go through the whole academic portion but i didn't spend much time in academics there either so this will be quick but i started out in architecture and i found that i was uh, uh, a little bit better at the technical aspects of, you know, where's the shade gonna fall or whatever, and not as artistic, and they wanted artistic. And so I switched to engineering, and I had to take calculus, and I had calculus at 7.30 in the morning, and the instructor was awful. So if you combine those two things, and you know, Calculus and math are one of those things where you better do well in Cal 1s so you can survive Cal 2, so you can survive Cal 3, so you can survive differential equations, as Smith would tell you. Uh, so I got out of there, and it, during that time, I'm not sure I knew what economics meant, but I ended up taking a class uh, under a professor here, uh, David Burke, I think. And economics and he was really 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 good and more than anything else you know if i'd had a really really good calculus instructor i might have been an engineer 
as my father was and my grandfather was. But he was really good. And so I decided to major in economics, that's free so far. Well, if you majored in economics, you could major in arts and sciences, but you still had to take accounting. So I took accounting, I did pretty well in accounting. And the guy talked me into switching my major to accounting. Then I ran into a couple of instructors that were not near as good or as interesting as he was, and I went back to economics. Math may be like this, economics is side by side. You can blow one and not worry about it. So uh, after uh, four and a half years, I ended up with a BA from Arts and Sciences with a major in economics and a commission as a second lieutenant in the Army. Now the Army has three combat units, divisions. One is uh, infantry, one is artillery, one is armor, and three semi-combat units, uh, military intelligence and signal corps, corps of engineers, then about a dozen that are like transportation and ordnance and quartermaster and whatever. That's what I wanted. I just didn't want the infantry. Well, I got the infantry. And so I had to think about killing people. Yeah. Sir. So 65, we're in Vietnam, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were hot in Vietnam. Probably the worst part of Vietnam was 1968 in the Tet Offensive, yeah. right? And so it's about time I'm getting my, my infantry yeah. cross rifle. Mm -hmm. And you had to think about killing people. Well, it didn't work out that way. Um, I'll, I'll jump ahead before I go back to campus life. Uh, a friend who had observed my participation in campus activities said, what are you gonna do now that you got your degree? And I said, well, I'm gonna go to Fort Benning, Georgia in April. He said, well, why don't you go to graduate school? I said, man, you gotta have decent grades to get to graduate school. He said, well, you know, I think I've watched what you're doing and, and you know, there's a master's degree program in public administration. And I said, that's the one that got the big fellowship paid for. I said, I just don't have the grades. He said, well, you know, this thing was funded by Rockefeller and there's a lot of fellowships out there and they're not being applied for. I said, well, maybe against nobody, I got a chance. And so I got in and um, uh, same guy says, a couple of things happened. He ended up getting me an internship with the city manager's office in Little Rock. We'll go off on that later. But uh, the uh, army didn't care. They would rather have me with a master's degree than uh, with just a bachelor's degree. So they approved that. And then I, uh, in the summer of 1971, I got a letter from the Army. The Army said, we are, the war is cranking down. And we have too many second lieutenants in the industry. If you would rather do 90 days active duty for training instead of two years of active duty, please sign this. That went in the mail. So I didn't have to go kill people. And I was greatly relieved. All right, campus life. Um, my freshman year, by accident, I ended up in Humphreys Hall, which was all freshman men at the time. Um, I was on the seventh floor, room 706. I um, uh, ran for floor vice president. And uh, there were four of us, and there had to be a runoff. And uh, I was in the runoff. And the counselor, there were four per floor at that time, three sophomore counselors, one RA and one resident advisor. And they were counting the votes, and they were gone like forever. They finally came out and said that I had won. And that was my intro to 
campus political life. Um, I found out about a year later, the reason the counselors were in there so long was that it was a dead tie. And they didn't know what to do. Even they were split. I guess the guy on my wing argued strongly. So vice president of seventh floor got me into the Humphreys Hall Senate and that got me involved in campus life. And that evolved into involvement uh, in resident hall association, which in those days was MIHC and WIHC, Men's Inner House Congress and Women's Inner House Congress were separate. All of the, all of the uh, residence halls were totally separate. Um, and as a sophomore, I ran for the student senate and I lost. Um, as a junior, I uh, had met as a sophomore counselor in Yoakum, second year I was in Yoakum. Uh, the guy across the hall was George Least. And George Least uh, was one of those guys that could talk to anybody. I can quote from his campaign speeches still. Um, and so I was his campaign manager, vice president of ASD um, as a junior, and he won it in a landslide. And then the guy that had won the um, ASG presidency didn't like his grade, so George got promoted. Um, we actually had a guy that was assigned to take classes with George and take really good notes. And so George got great. George didn't have a great problem. Um, so uh, that gets to my first senior year. Um, things that happened that began to impact uh, race. We invited Muhammad Ali to speak at a symposium theory. Um, this drove the state legislature nuts. They tried to pass a resolution that was sort of tied. Um, George and I went down to the Capitol to try to talk to some of them and got credit for trying. Uh, what we worked out, uh, David W. Mullins was the president of the university. There was not a system, just president of the university. And um, he came up with the idea of, well, let's let two legislators who like the idea of us bringing in Muhammad Ali debate two that don't like it. And that would calm the waters of those that didn't like it. Uh, we had that event in the, what was then called the men's gym and is now the performing arts hall, named after who? Uh, Brian. Just just east of the uh, Union. No, Faulkner. Faulkner. Yeah. So uh, and, and, and David, that was the year when Ali had, had, had uh, expressed that he was a conscientious objector. Correct. He was already on record as a conscientious objector and his case was on before the Supreme Court. Well, I don't, you know, I'm yeah, not sure. I'm, I'm trying to say it for yeah, stage, stage the situation. So he was not, with conservatives in the South, he was not a popular person, but we right. brought him to speak He's anyway. Not the Ali that he has become. Correct. He very con controversial. He was the best fighter in the world, but he refused to fight in Vietnam. And that's what made him super controversial. And we said, why don't you come speak down here? So he did, and he was very good. Um, other things that happened, in those days, the ASG uh, Senate did not have a president of the Senate who presided, the ASG president presided. So George presided over the Senate. Not only did he preside over the Senate, but he got to fill vacancies in the Senate. And so we had about three. 
uh, pretty quickly. And he appointed um, Gerald Jordan. Who knows who Gerald Jordan is? Was well, he already been in here? Oh, really? He was the first black student senator at the university, which is cool. Way to go, George. So George goes back to his room and gets a series of calls telling him that he's a dead man. And I came to his room and he was shaking. That's what it was like. Um, and the other two seats, I think he named one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen just so he could watch her. ASG Senate meeting. Um, one of the most uh, iconic things at the university was after MLK's assassination. There was a trade kind of a deal and a banner and Gerald Jordan was on the front line of that and the expression on his face of hurt was hurt more than I did that he was upset but it is such a wonderful photograph uh, somebody ought to go look it up and and put it in and print it and put it in one of the buildings um, So also later that spring, I ran for the student senate and lost again. But I didn't campaign any because I was campaign manager for Joe Karen Martin for ASG president. She was a non-Greek residence hall woman and she won in a close battle with uh, Fidel. And I gotta take a minute and go back to the Greeks. Two things about them. Uh, it seemed to me when I was a freshman and a sophomore that the Greek men were about 80% after alcohol and probably abusing women. And they were, in my opinion, they were elitist and thought that, you know, because they had, in my opinion, lucky sperm, that they were something special. They also held most of the elective offices on campus. And I found that offensive, as did George and Joe Karen Martin and Jim Burnett and Jim McKenzie and several others. So Mac, Framework was, I don't know, like that. Um, so that was part of the scenario that I was in was, I think non-Greeks should have access to these offices. So George was the first ASG president, Joe was the second, then a Sigma Nu got in, and then Gary McDonald got in, and then Gene McKissick was next. Yeah, Gene McKissick been here too? Yeah, that's pretty good. Pulling in the right people. <laughs> um, Gene McKissick is a special guy to me. Um, I was floating through uh, Yoakum Hall as a junior or senior, I'm not sure which. And Gene McKissick was in the uh, now disappeared space at the elevators on the third or fourth floor of Yoakum. And he was talking about why the playing of Dixie was hurtful to him as a black person. And until that time, it was a damn song. But he got it across and was really, you know, okay, I get it. So uh, 
there was a huge football game at the end of 69 that Arkansas lost 15 to 14. And the night before I had been driving back from a conference in the Texas a &M. And I was not here for the, um, for the pep rally. Uh, it was years before I found out that there was a, uh, an effort to express displeasure by the black student at that pep rally. So at this point, uh, Joe Karen Martin was uh, ASD president, and she was, interestingly enough, Jean McKissick had a brother, whose name is, what was his brother? Good. Anyway, he was, he was up there at the same time. And I was talking to Joe years later about this and about what Gene McKissick had meant to me. He said, he said, well, it was his brother that convinced me. Mm -hmm. So she did something that was incredibly strategic. Now with Dixie up there is a, a big issue. Uh, the playing of Dixie at the football game and other sporting events. Um, she brought the issue to the student senate. Remember, she's chairing the student senate, president of the ASG committee. And she set something up. She says, I want you to, by the way, I don't think Gerald was even a senator at that time. He was a senator the year before. We're going to let black students come in and talk to us about why Dixie bothers them. And she set it up where there were three white parentheses, senators talking with two blacks and about 10 Ray. or 12, what? Ray McKissick. Ray McKissick, thank you. Anyway, so she set these meetings up and the black students were articulate and able to communicate why it hurt. And they came back into general session and voted to ask the band director not to play Dixie. The band director, whose name I've forgotten, said, then we're not gonna play Dixie. The environment, however, of the university was uh, sad in that this angered students in an action angered a great deal of the students who were what's the proper term uh, negatively they were not probably they were not positively engaged in good race relations that is that so they actually uh, submitted petitions to reverse the Senate's action, which, and in doing that, asked that it be put to a vote of the student body. So they got the petitions raised, and then there was a campaign at a strange time to support the Senate's action or to reverse the Senate's action. I remember going to sorority houses and talking to students that would talk to us about, hey, this is important. Uh, there, so there was a healthy group of us that were, were trying to do the right thing on that campaign and we lost. And so uh, the Senate's action was reversed. The band director says, I don't care. I think the wisdom of the student senate's uh, action is the right way to go, and so he did. But it gives you an idea of what the majority of the students at the university at that time attitude was. Um,
I was on campus for about six years, including the graduate school years. And I didn't quit being involved because I was a graduate student. And my recollection of one of those years, I ended up being on the uh, Board of Publications. Board of Publications was the public, was the policy folks that oversaw the Razorback and the uh, Traveler, Razorback Annual Traveler Newspaper. Traveler Newspaper was well read in those days. And I'm not sure what it was that I made them mad about. But I ended up rating my own scathing, angry editorial <laughs> about something that I had made them do that they didn't like. Okay. Uh, one of your questions was about my career path, and I'll go through that in a second. But any questions about those years while I was up here as a student? Oh, yeah. Uh, Mullins, uh, I think it was his idea to have the legislators mm -hmm. um, debate. And we came in and said, uh, Dr. Mullins, the the uh, facilities management uh, said, called it something else, that they can't set up the, the uh, men's gym for that because they got another event that night. Set up the men's gym on that night. You understand? <laughs> and and Mullins was, uh, uh, you know, libraries named after him. He was. Um, uh, probably a pretty good uh, administrator. Uh, there's a lot of growth uh, physically, a lot of growth in, in uh, enrollment. Um, one of the things that uh, was a weakness for him was that he was a very poor public speaker. And the way he would compensate, if he needed to talk to the legislature or to the board of trustees or whatever, he would take the current ASG president with him to talk for him. And they were always accomplished and impressive and so forth. So uh, that was his one uh, uh, weakness. He was around for a long time. Um, question. Yes, sir, ma'am. You mentioned that uh, Greek life played a really big role in the government and holding up the offices. Yeah, like it does now. Like it does now. Would you say that uh, Greek life just played a big role or was a central focus of student life in general on campus? It was pretty significant. Uh, there was a residence hall environment that was a community because there wasn't just freshmen in the residence hall. And uh, in those years, there were enough space that there were intramural teams where every residence hall floor had a basketball team, for instance. So there was more of a residence hall culture than there is now, which you have to understand, obviously, not obviously, but we took that culture and we won a bunch of ASG presidency seats with it. So um, then we all graduated and went back. <laughs> uh, yes, it was a, a big deal. Um, my sense of things was that about 80% of the fraternity men were But only, but half the sorority women were pretty decent. The other half were people that you know, felt, felt like the world was owed to them. Part of my job now. <laughs> um, correct. Not near the number of uh, uh, out of state with respect to anywhere else, but mostly our campus. Um, I don't have a sense of what the 
what the student temperature is now, like I did then, I had a good sense. Uh, but um, I don't. Okay, other questions about while I was a student? Before I go into my next, how am I doing? I'm doing good. Career path. So the same guy that said I ought to go to graduate school, I got in graduate school. He said, what are you doing this summer? I said, man, 30 minutes ago, I thought I was at Fort Benning. He said, well, I'm, he was in that public administration program. And he said, I did an internship with the city manager's office in Little Rock, um, you know, which doesn't sound like a place that would have a great staff. But he said, they liked me and they wanted to know if there was anybody else um, up here that they could get to come do that. And they he said, and they asked me back too. So I said, yeah, sounds interesting. I lived in Little Rock, so, you know, uh, there would be no rent factor in the deal. So I went home and I asked my father where City Hall was. And he told me. And so I went down and asked to see the city manager. And the, the receptionist said, well, he'll be back at three. I said, can I come back at three? And I said, sure. So his name was Jack Merriweather. He ended up being a vice president of the university system many years later. But um, uh, he said, how do you want to do this? He said, well, in fact, why don't you just send me a letter saying why you want to do this? So I did. So my guy, uh, about 10 days later, says, I thought you were going to talk to the city manager's office in Rock. I did. Went down, talked to him, said, send me a letter. I sent him a letter. Oh, you needed to talk to the assistant city manager. He's the one that hires administrator pages. He says, in fact, I know where your letter is. It's on that stack of stuff that Jack doesn't mess with on the left side of his desk. He said, I need to let the assistant city manager know that. So he did. He called him and said, just a minute. He said, yeah, it was in that stack on the left side of his desk. So I got hired uh, down there for the summer of 70 and the summer of 71. And then after I finished my 90 days active duty for training and um, um, rest of my graduate degree, I got uh, stayed for a couple more years uh, in the city manager's office. The city manager's office was a funny place. There was a bunch of people who had master's degrees from Kansas University. Kansas University has a thing called Kusumat, which is a city management institute, and they're well known for training city managers. So it was a really good environment. Um, so I did that for a while. Um, the city manager changed. New city manager was okay, but it looked like to me that I probably ought to move on. So I went to see the assistant city manager and said, can I, and who I knew was looking for another job. I said, can I uh, borrow your resume? I know you spent a lot of time working on the format. But I don't feel like I need to reinvent the wheel. So he says, somebody been talking to you? I said, no, I just, you know, if you don't mind, let me, he said, okay, I'll give it to you, but Somebody been talking to you? I said, well, you can ask that once, but you can't twice. What are you telling me? Well, he'd gotten a call from the city manager of Texarkana. He wanted to know if I might be available and what I might cost. And he says, so he told me about it. He said, I wasn't, I'm not supposed to, but just wait till he does. So he called and I went down to Texarkana as assistant city manager in 1974. In my interview, I asked, I said, how long are you going to stay? And he said, uh, not more than another year. 
I think he missed it by like one day. So he left and I was doing acting for about six weeks and I was doing city manager for uh, a full-time position, which was pretty good at the age of 27. So, um, uh, meanwhile, I married my cousin's roommate who was from Tulsa and her father, uh, after I'd been at Texas for about three years, called and said, I'd like to talk to you about working in the family business. And I just didn't know he was crazy, but he was. And so that's my career mistake uh, working for him. Uh, he was highly leveraged. That means he spent money that he didn't have. And um, I ended up uh, working for him for 12 years. I could not get him out of trouble. As hard as I worked, I couldn't get him out of trouble. Um, so as he was uh, getting close to going under, um, I was introduced to a guy that was running for governor of Oklahoma. And I went to work for him in his campaign and and um, 96, I guess. And uh, he said, I want you to handle Tulsa and the surrounding six counties. And so I ended up with the surrounding 16 counties and he ended up winning. And so I went to Oklahoma City to work in state government and the uh, department that I ended up in was Oklahoma Tourism and Recreation Department. Um, the, uh, the reason that I liked that idea was that back in Arkansas, the head of Arkansas Parks and Tourism was my little brother. And I kept up with what he was doing. And I figured I might, I might, uh, get in over there and be six months behind, whatever. But I bet I can pick it up. I got I'm out to pick up the phone call. The local tourism and recreation department was so screwed up that I walked in there ahead of them. And I was able to make a, a lot of changes. Uh, the guy was a one term governor and I went from there to a, a community action agency in Hugo, Oklahoma, which is just north of the uh, Red River in South Oklahoma and about 70 miles uh, east, west of Arkansas, west of Arkansas line, west of the Queen-ish. Um, so I did that for seven years. I got a call one day from the Vice President of the University of Arkansas System who said, uh, we're looking at taking over uh, Winrock on Page Mountain. And uh, I'd like to talk to you about helping us uh, do that. So her predecessor in her job, she was the vice president of the university system, was Jack Merriweather, the guy that I'd worked for in Little Rock. And he was very knowledgeable about the Rockefellers and the Petty Dean facility and about the University of Arkansas, which he had retired from, or she wouldn't have been in her position. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay. Um, and he says, man, university needs to stay out of that deal. They go up there, they will screw that deal up. And it made her mad. And he said, well, I think we're going to do it anyway. And he says, well, if you're going to do it, go find David Davies. And so I got this call and the lady told me what was going on. She said, you going to be in Little Rock anytime soon? I said, no. Well, Van Lode of them came to see me in Hugo. And we talked about what might be done with the Rockefeller place on Petty Dean. And um, 
but they weren't in any hurry because the present inhabitant of it was uh, the Winthrop Rock or the uh, Winrock International, which was a uh, agricultural based uh, nonprofit that was providing technical services uh, in 65 countries around the world. And they had decided that uh, the top of Petty Jean Mountain was way too um, way too out of the main stay for what they needed to do. And they would needed to put their uh, executive offices in Washington, D.C. where they were close ac access to the various grants that they were living off of and that their back offices probably needed to be in Little Rock. So they were going to build a building in Little Rock and leave the mountain. But they weren't in a hurry. So uh, uh, I was asked to come over and write a uh, sort of a possibilities paper, which I did. And then nothing happened until 2002. And the, the vice president of the system called me and said, um, I've had to let everybody go to the top of the Garvin, Woodland, Garvin Woodland Gardens staff, which is part of the University of Arkansas landscape architecture program here. And she said, would you consider running it for me while we wait on who went to Brockville? property to finish. I said, well, let me talk to my wife. So I went home and we've been trying to figure out how in the hell do we get back to Arkansas. And so I told her about the phone call. She said, you took it, didn't you? I said, well, I thought maybe I ought to say that I need to talk to you. So um, uh, I took it. Um, it was a mess. Uh, they had a great, they had a very skilled landscape architect. They had a very skilled um, head gardeners, but they had no management experience. And so, um, and the, the, the guy that they'd gotten rid of, they had an advisory group and he wouldn't talk to them. Well, you know, I've been talking to, you know, city uh, councils and tourism commissions and everything. That's all I'd ever done. It was part of, it was part of my job. So I met with them and told them where the place was. And they were so <laughs> astonished to get somebody to talk to them that uh, uh, they uh, liked it. And we made some... Um, this was a brand new operation. And uh, botanical gardens will never make money on their own. They can survive once they have a large enough um, cash in the bank or, or uh, help me, what's the word? Huh? Endowment. If they got a big enough endowment, then they can earn part of their money. Well, we were trying everything to try to uh, uh, raise money. Uh, some of the things worked really well. Their Christmas lights deal was just fabulous. And normally in, there would be nobody in a garden in December, but we, we created significant parking problems. Um, and, and that worked. And we tried some other things, and that worked. And then after a couple of years, the, uh, the vice president of the system came back to me and said, okay, uh, it's getting close to when, when Rock International is going to leave. We need to write a, a more detailed proposal to the Winthrop Rockefeller Charitable Trust to whom when Rock International had to give the property back to on Penny, which was 188.378. The, um, the south boundary of 
uh, part of that property. The north boundary of part of that property is the south boundary of the Davies property on that same bad mountain. So it was like, you know, um, throwing me in a much of a comfort area, and I'm going to a little bit more of that in a minute. But anyway, the um, uh, we put together something, and I told the vice president of the system, I said, this is, this is just, I wouldn't give us 10 or 11 million on what this was. She said, that's what we're gonna start with. So she gave it to them and they said, we need a little meat on the bones of this idea. And she says, I can get that done. I'll get great people on top of it. It's going to run around three hundred thousand dollars. They said, "Okay." <laughs> so they gave the system office three hundred thousand dollars to do a study. He said, "David, go find the best people." So I found uh, accountants. I found uh, computer people. I found architects, engineers. Uh, landscape architects, uh, people that were hotel uh, professionals, restaurant professionals, uh, museum professionals, and we put together a two volume, really good proposal. And we, they asked for sort of an update on in September of 2004. And we met with them and they were very, sounded very encouraged about how we were doing and so forth. And were very light in their demeanor. So we met with them December 4th, of 2004, to present this two volume deal. And man, they were stone faced. I've never seen such a solemn loop of people, which included the Lieutenant Governor at that point, was one of them. So we presented it for about an hour and a half. They asked a few questions. And uh, they said, well, we want to talk about this. Uh, don't leave the ground. And we were asking for about $16 million capital improvements, uh, 20, uh, ended up being 20 million and 4 million a year in operational support because it wasn't going to make any money. So we were gone about an hour and they sent for us. And we came back and they said, okay, it's approved. Not any can you live with a little less. So I spent five years there. Uh, and uh, the Chairman of the board there was the vice president that I'd been working with, and she retired. And uh, Dr. Stug asked Dave Gearhart, for whom this building was named, to chair the board. And um, uh, he agreed to. He was a vice chancellor here at the time. And um, so the Trust asked for a uh, strategic plan. So we went and visited some Rockefeller places and we went and visited um, uh, one of the big policy uh, places in Washington. And uh, uh, wrote our strategic plan. And I'd written it where for every, and they had said, think big. And so I'd written it where I developed a group of partners from the university system on a 50 50 basis. What would you like to do if we provided half the funds and you provided half the funds? So I had about $11 million worth of match 
Well, meanwhile, the recession of 2008 hit, and the went to Rockefeller Charitable Trust endowment, Kitty, shrunk from 140 million to 90 some odd million. We presented our stuff, and they said, uh, it's not time to do something like that. Um, uh, Gearhart was not enjoying it, and he got promoted up here to chancellor. And at his last meeting, he said, um, I really enjoyed working with the staff, enjoyed working with the board, enjoyed working with David. No offense, no offense to the board. But if I can never get David to come to Fayetteville, I'll probably try to do it. So uh, I took him to the airport. Rockefeller built his own airport up there and took him to the plane. And he said, I wasn't kidding. You know, when you're ready to come to Fayetteville, talk to me. So um, uh, the uh, recession continued. The trust began to be unhappy and cut our budget. And I went to see your heart and said, get me out of here. And so he put me in the position that I'm in now. And um, uh, it's been a little over 10 years. Uh, the budget at the Winter Crossfell Institute was about $4 million a year, other than the $20 million we spent fixing the place up. Um, our housing budget is around $40 million. Our Pat Walker Health Center budget is around $8 million. Food Chartwell's dining is around $25 million. And that doesn't get to the theme of students and careers and everything else that we're doing now. And before the COVID deal, we were in great shape financially. Um, and we're working our way through it. Um, if I had time, and I see I do, I was going to give you a little bit on heritage and things that mean my heritage. And um, I'm from a family that writes it down. So we want to go back to the first time we were involved in higher education. Joshua Fry was a professor of math and philosophy at William and Mary in the mid 1700s. And he is a great grandfather about eight times. He ended up being the commanding officer of the Virginia militia, which while we were still cooperating with the British, his second in command was George Washington. Uh, he was killed when he was thrown from a horse in the back battle with the <coughs> French and Indians. Uh, he did some things that were unique other than being on the faculty of what was in it, I mean, William and Mary. He had a partner in surveying business. His name was Peter Jefferson. That was Thomas Jefferson's father. And uh, together they did the definitive map of, of uh, Virginia, Virginia and Maryland in that day. I had, um, I did not know that. And I was touring uh, Williamsburg and uh, I had read a book recently on Jefferson that had mentioned that Joshua Fry was Peter Jefferson's partner and they had, uh, among other things, surveyed the boundary between North Carolina and Virginia. And so we're touring the government building and we get, we had a really great docent, tour master, whatever you want to call them. And her last words were, and this on the wall is the famous 
Brad Jefferson, that Virginia and the holy cow. Uh, anyway, so I, after the meeting, I said, Do they sell that map? He says, Oh, you can find it in two or three places. So I bought one. Um, meanwhile, down in North and South Carolina, uh, there were a bunch of Davieses who were essentially Presbyterian ministers, but one of them, and I'm not sure, his, but his name was David Davies, and his son and the next four generations were uh, Presbyterian ministers. But anyway, he was a uh, on the side of the of the Americans in the Revolutionary War. He was captured by the British and shot with his own gun. Um, his son was John Davies. His son was John B. Davies. His son was uh, John Leroy Davies. And John Leroy Davies was asked to come to Augusta and Cotton Plant, Arkansas, and do two churches, two Presbyterian churches there. And um, uh, he went out, met with them, went back. He sent the family, which included four daughters, two little boys, and his wife, and a helper, uh, to on ahead. He stayed back to clean up the real estate holdings and so forth, and he died. He had an older son who was at Lake Providence, Louisiana as a Presbyterian minister and the people from Augusta and uh, Cotton Plant who were stuck with this baby's family and no preacher went down there and said, you need to come up and do what your father was gonna do. And so he did. And he, uh, his name was Samuel Wilson Davies. He uh, uh, started a church in, there was already a church in Cotton Plant. He started a church in Augusta, is still there, like so many other Presbyterian churches, it's a museum now. But he left in 1874 and came and started the first Presbyterian church of Fayetteville, Arkansas. And so my grandfather, who was his son, uh, uh, grew up here. Uh, he had three older sisters that graduated here before he did, uh, like in 1895, no apologies, 1895 and 1897. Uh, after being uh, from, he was an engineer after there having been four Presbyterian preachers in a row. And so we don't know what went wrong with them, but he did it. He ended up uh, uh, going to Conway County, Arkansas, which is Marlton and so forth, uh, building a bridge over the Arkansas River in about 1922 or three. Uh, set up practice as the county surveyor and whoever what needed him. The Civilian Conservation Corps was created in uh, 1932, 33, after the election in 32 of who? History FDR. FDR, right. And in his first 100 days, he created the CCC, and Arkansas uh, participated in that. Uh, project and they called my grandfather and said, if you'll help us put the application together, you can run it. So my grandfather uh, took 200 men uh, and built Petty Jean State Park. And uh, they were paid a dollar a day and the army provided them their uniforms and boots and so forth, and uh, my grandfather and his uh, supervisors provided their daily supervision 
and they built that park. Um, sometime immediately after that, my grandfather was named the first uh, state parks director for the state of Arkansas. Uh, he was a political casualty when a guy by the name of Homer Atkins uh, fired him to put in a buddy. Homer Atkins did something else. Homer Atkins was governor. He fired J. William Fulbright as president of the University of Arkansas. Um, as it ended up, Atkins served a term or two as governor, ran for the U.S. Senate against J. William Fulbright, and Fulbright beat him. Fulbright used the Alumni Association database to be able to reach into every county. Uh, but uh, he did that. Um, so my father grew up in Marlton, played football for the Devil Dogs, came up to the university about 1931 uh, with his sister. I got to 15 after. His sister was two years younger than he was. When he went to school in the first grade, he came home uh, every day and taught her everything he learned. And he did that in the second grade too. So when it was time for her to go to school, the school figured it out and put him, put her in the third grade. So she graduated in high school the same as he did, except she was valedictorian. He wasn't at 15 and came up here and graduated Phi Beta Kappa at the age of 19 in chemistry. So she was pretty quick. Her, her, her children have done extremely well. Uh, my dad uh, did a term with Arkansas Health Department. He then went to World War II, uh, came back and went into business with my grandfather, uh, laying water lines and sewer lines. My grandfather retired at the age of 76, and my dad went to work for the Arkansas Pollution Control Commission, or actually Arkansas Water Pollution Control Commission. Uh, a lot of states, every time there was a pollution something, they'd start a new agency. Arkansas did. So when the Clean Air Act was passed, they just took the word water out of the agency's name and said Arkansas Pollution Control Commission and gave them air. Then they gave them solid waste. Then they even gave them uh, the nuclear plant. So my, grand, my father ended up being uh, a cabinet level uh, secretary under um, bumpers and prior. Uh, You've heard what I did. My little brother, who's three years younger, graduated here in journalism, uh, went to uh, work for the Arkansas Parks and Tourism Commission, where he worked for the director for three years, and then he was named state parks director, and then that person retired, and he was named executive director of parks and tourism served that agency a total of 43 years. And two or three years ago was given a honorary doctorate by the University of Arkansas right here. So um, that's sort of my family heritage uh, or a part of it, you know. Questions? Surely. I put everybody to sleep out in the no. online area. Yes, sir. So you talked about knowing the nutrition. Yes. And, and how has you know, knowing that people are bad and being involved in the government early on influence the changes or the way for human affairs in this campaign? 
I think what they did uh, brought attention to uh, the good people like Joe Martin, who helped solve the, the uh, Dixie deal. That was probably what they did. Uh, uh, Gene is a good guy. There were, years ago, Arkansas was in the Southwest Conference, and uh, Gary McDonald, who preceded Gene as ASG president, and Gene and I would go to the uh, Southwest Conference basketball tournament together uh, while I was living in Tulsa. And, uh, and we had some great times. Um, I asked Gene to come make a presentation on Gene, but his health was bad and he didn't get to do it. So I haven't talked to him in a couple of three years. I'm glad to hear that your wise professor brought him in and Gerald Jordan. I think bringing attention to it without being, I suspect that in other places, they were more belligerent than here. So they were not, uh, not doing anything that uh, Other than bringing attention to it, you know, no, no damage of any kind or anything like it. Who else? We've got seven minutes. One of our students asked you. Um, question just in the uh, list of questions that I liked. What do you envision as the role of white students in combating racism on our campus today? Well, the first thing I need to do is listen. Uh, as Joe Martin did. And then see if there's a way to help. But um, I think that's, there has to be that, that conversation going on with feeling the way that Gene and Ray were able to uh, sincerely express the hurt. Um, any more questions like that? I know I skipped a bunch. Oh, no, I I like that question. Um, what? My middle name is Goodbar. Goodbar. David Goodbar Davies. My grandfather, Goodbar, was a Baptist preacher. So my mother's side, I think he was probably the only one that was that preacher. He had, he was the one that had worked on the Prouty Lower Ranch out from Wheatley before he went to the seminary and became a became a preacher. Um, interesting guy. He was uh, he was a problem solver. He retired as a minister at the age of 65 and started serving churches as an interim minister because they had their pastor had left. In a lot of these cases, pastors had left because the church was screwed up. So he put back, he put a lot of churches back together in the 15 years that he did that. It may have been his greatest ministry. But he, he said, I'm never going to, they were, all wanted him to stay. He would never stay more than a year. And uh, so they knew that they had to find somebody in that time. But that's, he was a great fisherman. Uh, he had been an elected uh, official early in his career, I think county clerk in Lono County, uh, and was hired 
uh, in his later years to be the lobbyist for the Arkansas Baptist Convention before the state legislature. It's real simple. No alcohol, no gambling. <laughs> that was what his, he was supposed to watch for. Thanks, Tim. Anybody off stage anywhere? Anybody Zoom people? David, thank you for. You're very welcome. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. 